Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Stacey Wilson Hunt. Before we speak to our guests today, I wanted to let you know that the foundation has set up a COVID relief fund in order to support thousands of union performers who are going through some tough times. Since March, thanks to your donations, the foundation has given over $6.1 million in emergency aid to more than 6,600 performers and their families. If you are a SAG-AFTRA member and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. And thank you in advance for your support. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Aubrey Plaza and Lawrence Michael Levine from Black Bear. Welcome to you, Aubrey and Lawrence. How are both of, both of you today? And where are you more operatively? I am doing very good. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm currently in Turkey. I'm oh my goodness. Shooting, yes, I'm shooting a movie here in the south of Turkey. Um, and day four of shooting. So wow. it's all, it's all happening. And, and what is COVID production life like? Has, has it been a strange transition? Yeah, it's so weird. I don't, I want it to end. I don't want <laughs> movies like this. It's so um, yeah, really, um, it's bizarre. It's there, there's just a lot of protocol, a lot of obviously a lot of testing. I mean, everyone has to be so safe, and um, it just adds like a whole other logistical like nightmare level to shooting. But um, yeah, and I don't. I mean, I'm I, I'm very lucky to be working, honestly. Um, so I'm very grateful for the for the job. But it's definitely it's it's. It's a whole other level of shooting. That's very <laughs> yes. Everyone has a new skill set after this whole thing. It's, it's tested all of us for sure. Totally. And Lawrence, you are in Pasadena. We are very happy to have you here and honored that you would join us during such a difficult time. And before we talk about Black Bear, which has tested my, my mental acuity now for, for days. And so I thank you for that. I would love to know, since we have an audience. You like that feeling? <laughs> I, I, as if we haven't been tested enough in the last year. But yes, it feels yeah. good. I'm, I'm keeping my brain sharp. We have a lot of um, actors watching right now, and I would love to know what was the first performance you saw, whether stage or screen, that moved you, where you felt viscerally changed after watching this person perform? Ah, uh, God, that's such a hard question for me to answer. Like, I have so many answers to that question. Um, I don't remember the first, I don't remember the first but i i have very weird like memory like flashes of memories of things that like and i will say and a lot of people know this about me that i was a very big judy garland fan when i was yes I knew this. Mm -hmm. yeah. so i've talked about it a lot um mm -hmm. and that is true i i discovered her um pretty early on and i just became very obsessed with her, mostly her, um, her acting in her movies, but her performances like later in life, like her, her, um, like concert performances and stuff. Like there was just something about her live performing that really, um, blew my mind as a, as a kid. And, uh, and then I have a very just strange memories of, okay, a league of their own was very big for me. <laughs> I don't know why when I hey, watched that some, movie. I can see I, that there's some amazing actors in that movie. Yeah, no, I used to like pretend I was Gina Davis. Um, and I used to like actually think that I could like um, transport like in inside of her. Um, I, like, <laughs> or that, that that doesn't make sense. Also, Bette Midler was really big. Uh, uh, I, I remember seeing For the Boys. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that movie. I, I know exactly. Movie, yeah. I saw like very weird movies when I was little, like movies that. I don't know why I saw them, but there were just movie. A lot of it was live performance. And then comedy wise, that was a whole other thing. But Janine Garofalo was the first stand up comedian I ever saw live. Mm -hmm. I saw her in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, and I just was like, oh my God, she's so like weird and cool. And yeah, I mean, I could go on and on. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good um, diversity of people. I love that. How about you, Lauren? Have you guys seen the, ro the have you seen the rose? Oh yeah, the ropes. Yeah, no, I have the rose. Oh, the rose. Yes. I love. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah, like her mean. best performance. I She's so good in that. Yeah. And then uh, I also like Down and Out in Beverly Hills. 
Oh my god! Yeah. Oh yes. Um, I mean, but the rose, she's really, really good. Also, yeah. Kathleen Turner was very big for me. Like when I saw *Romancing the Stone*, that was like one of the movies that made me want to be an actress. Like I was like, that's the that's like the kind of movie I want to be in. Um, I love Kathleen Turner. Oh, and you know what's interesting? The, the movies that you mentioned, they're all commercial movies and they're all movies that I saw in theaters. They're not like sort of quote unquote art films from the 80s. But those are the movies that if you can bring a great performance to them, they last. I, re I watched Romance in the Stone recently during quarantine and her performance is amazing. I know, I love it so much. It's so yeah. wonderful. I think for me, just um, the actors that I fell in love with um, were the um, early, well, not early, um, like Cary Grant's, for The Philadelphia Story, for example. Like mm -hmm. when I was little, my mom showed me, it was kind of a great thing that she did. She showed me a lot of old movies and um, I really, really liked Cary Grant. So I watched, I think, every everything that Cary Grant was in. And it's, I still think there's no actor who's been in more great movies. Hmm. Like, I don't think there's, you, he's just been in probably 40 great movies. Hmm. So if he's in it, you like know it's going to be good. And he was, um, he's sort of the Sam Jackson of his time. <laughs> <laughs> I like Sam Jackson too, but we're talking about like formative years because yeah. something about the fact that the movies were old and they're more clearly like acted because the style was different and I guess more artificial in some ways, but um, still fantastic in its own kind of way that um, I, I think those were the first people that I, I kind of fell in love with. Ka Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart, I really love, Catherine Hepburn, Ingrid Bergman, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of people. Betty Davis, I love oh, Betty Davis. Absolutely. Great forebears that we've had for, for this art form. And going to Black Bear, and obviously I can see the inspirations of your life as a filmmaker sort of being drawn into the story. But what inspired Lawrence this particular format, this narrative, this sort of meta metaphysical examination of these themes? Because you can you could have told the story in a more straightforward way. But what was it about what you wanted to say that this format lent itself to to using? I, I don't I, I can't say there was a logical reason that I decided to do it. I, I and if there was, I don't remember it. But <laughs> um, I know that I just. You know, I had been writing. I started really writing when I was about, um, I don't know, I guess 20 or so. Um, and I had been doing it almost every day for about 20 years. And um, I was just kind of tired of doing the same old thing. You know, I felt that I had worked in the three-act structure um, in a variety of genres and it all was just seeming a little stale and old to me. And I wanted to try something different. I was inspired by European cinema and uh, Korean cinema. And um, I wanted to just take some chances and do something different. And um, it was kind of, I'm interested in dream films mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of wanted to make one. And this film has a pattern of a recurring dream that I have. Uh, so I wanted to actually do, as I was telling you earlier, three variations on the theme, but there was only room for two. Mm. Uh, but but um, anyway, I, so I wanted to show this repetitive kind of patterning um, with, uh, with the movie and to show how there's like variations on this, these preoccupations we have. Um, it's not really a great answer because I didn't really do it for any logical reason. It was more intuitive and emotional and just wanting oh. to break free of constrictions of conventional like screenwriting that. and stuff. And it's interesting, as, as you said, that it's so true. Even movies that are experimental, still most of them adhere to that three-act structure. It's been this sort of preordained rule for so long. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what was refreshing about this is that I did expect a third act and that it ended. And I thought, oh, but that's what I like is I was challenged to break out of that structure that even I'm so used to as a storyteller and, and someone who consumes stories. So I think that was really, whether it was intentional or not, I think that's one thing that does push the audience very intensely. So congratulations. No, I just want to be clear that the, mm -hmm. the there would have been a third chapter, but I wouldn't consider that a third act. 
right, it's, right. You know, a repetition of three themes. So, yes, that's I mean, I guess point. in some ways it would be a third act, but not what I think of as, as a narrative <laughs> that escalates, you know, into the third act. Right. This movie goes. Right. Like <laughs> if wave, you charted it, like it would wave, be. Like a yeah. wave pattern, yeah. And Aubrey, I know in some respects this role was crafted for you or with you in mind. When you did read the finished script, what was your first thought? What was your gut reaction to what you had just read? My first thought was like, how could you, how could Larry ever think that I could do that? <laughs> it was written in such a way that was like very scary to me. Hmm. Um, I was scared. It was scary. Um, it terrified me. Um, and I think it scared me because I, I just knew I was, I wanted to do it, but I knew, but I also knew that it, if I was going to do it, it was going to be really challenging and scary, um, and hard. Um, so I think it was, I was scared by it, <laughs> but excited. <laughs> I was excited by it, but also I was like, you know, I, it's, it was a lot, for, it was a lot. Hmm. And because the script is so unique, was there a different way you approached learning your lines as compared to more linear stories that you've told, Aubrey? Yeah, I mean, I don't ever really learn my lines. Like, I, I don't, it's like weird. Like, I don't, I, I sometimes think about like, when did I learn my lines? Because I don't really think about it like that. Um, What's your process then? That's such a fascinating thing to hear from an actor. Well, I mean, I'm not saying I don't learn. I mean, I have to learn them, but I think I learn them through, I mean, I, I learn them through, I guess, uh, just like working on the scenes um, and kind of like dissecting the scenes and, and, and thinking about what's behind all of the lines. Um, and then if I really know that, then I know what line, what the lines are because I know what, what's happening in the scene rather than like thinking about like sent sentences or something mm -hmm. but um but this script I think um I also kind of uh incorporated kind of this like dream-like approach to working on the script because I knew because it was written in that way and there and it felt like there was kind of this abstract like unconscious kind of narrative happening underneath of it all and so I kind of experimented with some a different approach in some ways, um, where I, I also kind of use my dreams, um, mm. to, to work on the scenes. Um, mm. I kind of, I kind of tried to do some things that I'd never done before with this script. So I wow. felt like I more into that, but. Wow. Well, whatever you did, I think worked really well. <laughs> Thank you. And Lawrence, tell me about choosing a location. Cause obviously this is a very contained location, very specific location. How did you find that particular, I, this is upstate New York, is that true? Yeah. Okay. Adirondacks. And, and so beautiful. I said that right, right, I think, for, on the first try for the first time. Ever. It will <laughs> never did. happen again. Adir Adirondacks. And tell me about finding that beautiful home, that, that perfect view of the lake, the, the pier. There are all these things that probably had to be exactly as you had pictured them. How difficult was it to find that? And then how much time did you have there before you started shooting? Um. I'll answer the first part of the question mm -hmm. first. Um, the, uh, a friend had shown me some pictures of his family had a camp in the uh, Adirondacks. Adirondacks. Um, <laughs> yeah, there were, like um, a bunch of cabins around a lake. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you should shoot a movie in this, you know? And I looked at it and I thought, oh, well, if he's saying I should shoot a movie in it, maybe they'll give me a discount or maybe <laughs> there'll be producers on the movie or something. I, I don't know. I thought sure. like, you know, they would hook me up in some way. <laughs> That's always and, the uh, hope, right? Yeah. And around that time I was, I had, um, I had kind of saved up enough money to take a chance and do a kind of project on speculation. So, um, so those two things came together and I wrote a script for this particular location with these pictures of mine. Oh, wow. And when, it, yeah, and when it came time to do the movie, um, that new location was no longer available. Oh, no. It was very specific. It had 
specific elements, which are three separate structures. All of them have the view of the lake. On the other side of the lake, there's nothing, no other houses. Mm-hmm. And that was really important to me because I, this movie is supposed to feel very dreamlike. And I don't think if you're like looking across a lake and just seeing a bunch of houses on a lake, right. that's very right. mysterious or dreamlike. <laughs> so I, um, I, I, the place wasn't available. So I had to find this very specific location that, um, that, as far as I know, it didn't even exist. So this was the only place that we saw that, that fit all the criteria. And in fact, was more beautiful, no, no offense, but it was more beautiful than the location than the location that I had written it for specifically. So that was cool. It was really inconvenient um, and remote and uh, created a lot of logistical problems when we were shooting. Um, there were blackouts and uh, you know, there was no cell phone service or, or oh internet God. to speak of really. I mean, you, you could get it in like weird parts of the forest. Right. Like you had like crew wandering off during breaks into like the depths of the forest, holding up their phone, <laughs> you know? So it was kind of crazy and there was no good food around. No offense to the place that <laughs> the weird place that did give us our food, but it wasn't, you know, exactly. Latest. Well, all the usual creature comforts of set life. It sounds like we're not there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even like even on an uncomfortable set, we had more than we had. This is a particularly uncomfortable set, but um, wow. I like that house. I, I really like that house, and mm. and the lake. Most important thing on the other side of that lake, there was nothing. It was beautiful. Yeah, and tell me a little bit about and Aubrey. You can jump in the, the rehearsal time you had before, and how you spent that time specifically. Was it? You know, there are a lot of long shots. It feels very theatrical, a lot of these scenes. How did you spend that rehearsal time? And, and how did it help you feel confident? Um, yeah, we didn't really rehearse, but we, because um, we, we, we got to the location. I don't remember how many days you were there before me, but I, when did, I got there only a couple mm-hmm. days before we started shooting. I think I was only there three days before you. Right. Oh, wow. And Chris was there a day before we started shooting. Um, so we didn't really rehearse, but we we talked through the script. Like we sat with Larry and we read the script together and just kind of discussed anything that we felt was like was worth discussing or, you know, questions that we had and stuff like that. But we didn't um, like do proper rehearsal. Wow. And yeah. did you feel- and I, had, I, I had conversations with them prior to the shoot, um, either in person or on the phone uh, about the script. So like private script consultations and then a group one. And, um, you know, if you're not going to rehearse, I like at least used to like, I at least like to do that. I mean, we just didn't have time for rehearsal, but I also like to change any lines that the actors don't like. Hmm. Well, I was just going to ask about that, the collaboration factor with the actors, but also is there any improv that we see on screen versus what was written? I'd say the normal amount. M- most of it, uh, I mean, it's it's a scripted movie with some improvisational embellishments. I mean, one one great thing I like pointed out in almost every interview <laughs> that um, well, there are a couple of great things. Um, Aubrey came up with the idea to have the uh, uh, the boom operator or the the sound mixer, whatever. They're both in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, to do the do the um, room tone uh, <laughs> after she was collapsed on the floor. That was that always was great. Like, so that wasn't in the script. That was really cool. Very and funny. a lot of the business that um, Paula and Chris do uh, during the scene within the scene, a lot of that is is improvised. Well, um, it feels very real. I mean, I did have to question if those were actually your crew members who you were also shooting because it felt so real having been on sets. I Every person just felt exactly like people I've met. So that was very striking. I did try to cast people who looked like their crew job, Mm -hmm. uh, but also there were crew members in the movie. The only one I think that has a line was Hightower and um, Aubrey kind of picked him out. Oh, that was another thing she added was that she made her character smoke in the script. There's no reference of that. And then she came up with the idea to have a PA waiting around, which is really funny. (laughs) <laughs> waiting around to give her her cigarettes after like every take or setup or whatever. And she chose this guy Hightower who just everybody loved. He was kind of just a, 
He's a great, great, uh, great guy on set. And um, <laughs> anyway, so that's the only How crew member who's doubling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the street without being recognized. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and Aubrey, what would you say is distinct about, and I'll call him Larry since you are, I was using the more formal that's word. That's fine. No, it's okay. <laughs> What is distinct about the way that Larry works with actors that you hadn't ever experienced before that makes you want to collaborate with him again? Well, does she even? We don't know. Does she even? Yes. If so, <laughs> um, maybe Larry. Um, <laughs> I think Larry is an actor. I don't know if he would consider himself an actor, but the way that I got yeah, to know Larry was as an actor um, because we, we played a married couple on this um, Netflix comedy series. So I got to spend five days with him. Um, where that was we were easy, just, easy, by the way, which I love. Yep. Yes, which was easy, <laughs> where we, we just got to act together. Um, and I think I realized very quickly that Larry cares about performance and, and the acting process um, just as much as I do. And we really bonded over that. Um, and I just, I've worked with so many directors that really don't care about it. Um, they don't hmm. want interested in having discussions about why, why you're saying what you're saying or, um, or anything like that. Um, that's really but, sad to hear that, that, that that's been your experience, which seems so ridiculously counter to the entire point of, of making stories. I, I agree, but uh, not everybody work. Not everybody works like that. Some people mm. are more, they're more interested in the visuals or they're more, you know, they don't care. It's more about the plot, whatever it is. But, mm. um, but I think, yeah, I think that that was what was the most exciting to me about working with, working with Larry, that I just knew how much he cared about that part of the process. And, um, and he was just very, um, he was just very thoughtful and very sensitive about every part of it. And he was paying attention to things in, in a way that I think we all felt like we were in really good hands when it came, mm -hmm. when it came to um, the scenes and the performance. And, and, uh, and I think one thing, other thing I loved about working with Larry is that he doesn't compromise. And I think a lot of times when you're under the gun, you know, and you're, dealing with a set where you need to keep, you need to go. And, you know, a lot, most, a lot of times people are afraid to like push the envelope or to go again, or, you know, they'll just go like, all right, fine, we got it. Let's move on or whatever. But Larry was, you know, it just felt like he just really was paying attention and really cared. So, um, hmm. and I think, we, yeah, it was very obvious when we were shooting that one. Wow. And then Larry, like, I'm sorry. No, 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 please do. Go ahead. Well, if you're going to ask me the same question, I would just say on the show, I mean, you know, like everyone knows that Aubrey's a comedic genius, really so funny. Um, but on the show, uh, I could see how serious and determined she was. And that's yeah. kind of what I look for when I'm, when I'm trying to find people to work with is people who are serious. I mean, just like you, just like she's saying about directors, that don't care about performance. There's also actors who don't give that much of a shit. You know, there's people who are on their cell phone between takes, like taking pictures of themselves or Instagram. I mean, there's people who might think they're serious, but they aren't. And, um, and you know, th that's, that's what I'm looking for is people who are there to, to work and create something meaningful and to have a rich, meaningful experience and not just like be famous or make money or because because they're attractive or whatever it is you know um so uh so yeah kind of similar reason and i feel like making movies the way i approach it is like it's a war to give the actors time hmm. like everything is conspiring against giving the actors time to do their thing and i'm just trying to get as much time as possible so that they can can do their work Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes sense if you don't know the logistics yeah. of shooting movies, but they're a nightmare. And it's just like, Very hard. sometimes you feel like, does anybody even want to be here? Does anybody <laughs> even understand that we have to give these actors a certain amount of time to work? It's like, you give them two takes and the AD is like, uh, you know, we got to move on to the next one. It's just like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, no one cares. 
Sorry, but no one cares about your beautiful photograph. They care about actors doing interesting, meaningful things. And if it's nice if you can make it look pretty or interesting in some way, that's a supplement that, that in my opinion, serves to heighten the actor's work. Mm. Um, you know, uh, but I think the most, perform that the most important thing in movies is performance. I mean, at least that's what I think, but maybe we're moving into a new era where every movie is going to be just a bunch of animated robots like, <laughs> oh, doing yeah. acting cliches, I don't know. <laughs> but as long as that's, there's still a chance to make a movie with real people feeling real things, I, I'm going to take advantage of it. Well, and, and I think, and it's sad that this is the case, but I think that's what's so striking about this movie is that that's exactly how it feels to the viewer. And then it reminds me that it's a rare feeling now to feel that way and to see people interacting in a way that feels very um, mission focused, I guess, kind of based on what you just said. So I think you, you very, very much had a vision and executed it and the performances are just, they're so good. It's scary. I think is the best way because it feels so incredibly real. So I, it's not that you say that. That's really what, really what we were going for. So well, it was very, very well achieved. And I would love to know, was there a particular scene or day on set or sequence that you found incredibly challenging in terms of execution? Or maybe you were, you had, you know, power issues or you had, like you said, those other things conspiring against pulling off something very uh, complicated. The sequence that the sequence of the scene within the scene or the scene within the movie, right. Within the movie. Right. You know, the big scene where, um, Allison has her breakdown was a very, very scary situation because we really didn't have a lot of time. And one of our actors, Paola, uh, who plays Kaya got sick and oh, had no. to go to the, had to go to the hospital. Oh, and horrible. she's in everything. So, uh, you know, first of all, I'd never blocked a scene with 20 actors before maybe more, maybe less, I don't really know, but there were a lot of people on set and even the extras who weren't talking had blocking to choreograph. So it was complex to, to choreograph all that stuff. And um, on top of choreographing it all and timing it all, uh, there was a fact that Aubrey had to be feeling these really, really intense emotions. And as an actor myself, um, I know how hard it is to sustain those kind of emotions for a prolonged period. So there was already this um, inborn time pressure where it's just like, look, she can't do a million takes of this. We right. need to be on top of it. Once we start shooting, we need to be ready to go and the blocking all needs to be right. So that, that would have been challenging in a normal circumstance without somebody getting sick. Um, who was in almost every uh, shot, even if in the background or whatever, because the camera was documentary style. So it could kind of rove anywhere and catch her. And she's pretty integral to the blocking and she's pretty integral to the scene um, yeah. in a supporting way. Wow. So um, anyway, she ended up getting back, but we lost about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. So it really only gave us two hours to, to shoot it. And I just thought, man, I don't know if it's going to happen. Wow. I mean, we'll, worry, we'll worry about that later. We didn't have money for reshoots. We didn't have money to add days. Um, so it was very dire. And, uh, and in the middle of it, she's got to do this, this uh, incredible performance, this emotional work. So. And Aubrey, how did you feel when, when you felt that sort of pressure cooker mounting? And also what's hard about that scene too is that your character is supposed to be drunk which could also, you know, there's a campy way to play that, but then that's not obviously the goal. How are you balancing the physicality of her sort of stumbling around with this sort of complete breakdown that she's having? Um, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think at that point, at that point, the lines of like reality were blurring for me because the first part of the shoot, we were doing the first part of the film. So it was just Chris and Sarah and I, and uh, it was just more intimate and more focused. And then, and then once all the other actors came in and once we started shooting uh, like more documentary style, things just started to shift uh, in the house, like the energy Ooh. in the house. And uh, we were all in the house all the time, um, kind of 
uh, the whole time. So I think I just was not, I was never out of it. I think I was just always kind of in it because I knew that, um, that like Larry said, we, we weren't going to have a lot of time. So I did, there wasn't, you know, I couldn't go, you know, I couldn't be like, well, I'm going to my trailer. <laughs> right. You know, right. Take a minute, prepare. There was no, no trailers, no nothing. I was just in it. So I think I just, I think at a certain point I just kind of surrendered to that and just said, and just decided like, this is real. And, uh, and in terms of the physicality stuff, like, that was more, uh, yeah, it was like, a, it was like a weird game I was playing with myself, like a very mm. fucked up, unhealthy game <laughs> that I was playing with myself, <laughs> where I was just like, just tricking myself into feeling drunk for hours and hours and, uh, and just kind of not let it, not, uh, not caring about, um, uh, like hurting myself really just like kind of letting my body just kind of fling around and uh, just like working myself up into a state and just trying to maintain that that level it's like a sport hmm. like, very yeah well no, it, it felt like a miracle <laughs> it felt like a miracle <laughs> yeah. well I think the the claustrophobia that you probably were all feeling that pressure, I mean, it's sometimes those things coalesce in a beautiful way. And I think that from everything you've just told me, and I think back to that sequence, it, it's really, it's, it's a lot to digest. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep thinking about that scene for a long time. And I have to say, I mean, just not to, you know, evoke the, the common comparison to, to Jenna Rollins, but I haven't seen a performance like this from, a, from a woman in many, many decades. So I, I think you're, you're her heir apparent, Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk about her, but she, you asked like what our first, you know. Yes, of course. And Jenna, saw, obviously, she's, she's amazing. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, me that too. was like I a. Didn't, I didn't discover her until later, probably. Me too. Yeah. Later. I've been rewatching. Yeah, what kid is watching, you know, Cassavetes. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. when I did see that, I opened my mind to a whole new dimension of acting. Yeah. She means a lot to me. Thank she's you. She's so very, much. very special. And in closing, how has this experience changed what you want to pour yourself into moving forward? I, I, every actor I've spoken to in the last year has talked about this winnowing down of life is short. I don't want to work on crappy stuff. <laughs> Everything is so hard as it is. How has this focused you in a way that maybe you weren't as focused before? And either person can start. I'll just say like, I, this, I'm very lucky to um, have opportunities to do all kinds of movies. I mean, sometimes not anything I want, but like, you know, I get offered certain things and like not all of them are um, great. And so I think, I think this movie was definitely like a risky movie to do. It's like, you just never know how, how independent films are going to turn out and, um, I think it only made, it's, it's made me feel like very, um, lucky that like I'm in a position where I can try you know, make a movie like this happen in whatever way I can. So I think moving forward, I'll, it's just, I think it's given me hope, um, that, um, people still want to see artistic films and films that aren't just pandering or commercial movies. Like I think. It just, yeah, it's only, it's just made me um, feel like, yes, like it's worth it to, to try to do something different. Mm. And, um, maybe it could work. So. I like that. The pain is worth it. Totally. <laughs> and Larry, has this bolstered your confidence in wanting to kind of push yourself even further? Um, I always wanted to make, um, the best possible, best, most interesting movies I, I possibly could, but I think my definition of what's good is a little weird and maybe <laughs> not the normal person's, you know? Uh -huh. um, some filmmaker said, uh, it was the guy, I forget his name. I think it was, I think his name is, um, he did this movie, Coming Apart. Have you seen it, Stacey? I haven't. I've heard the title, but I haven't seen it. The torn movie. He said something like, uh, I aspire to the 
boring and pretentious or something. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie was very high entertainment value for my, me. This, this movie was my sellout. No, I'm, just, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally kidding. Um, this movie really changed a lot for me, actually. I, I because when I was writing it, it was purely just, um, like I said, just to, to try something new and um, to kind of, like Aubrey was saying about, um, about being afraid to play the role. I mean, I was pretty afraid for a long time to write a movie like this. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I just kind of dove into it. Um, you know, I read, I, I'm a big admirer of Robert Altman and um, he, he, he once said that uh, he, he decides what to do by what scares him, what he's afraid to do. And I thought that was, that's a cool way, a cool, cool code to live by. So um, I guess, yeah, it just, it's encouraging that a movie like this did find an audience. I mean, whatever it is, I don't exactly know because they don't fucking share the numbers with <laughs> these crooked companies. <laughs> <laughs> like the so hand never, feeds me. But, you'll never uh, be a metric for your success. It'll remain a mystery. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, it's hard to tell, but I think people are talking about it on the true. internet. It is true. Like, how do we know? Like, it feels like people are discovering it, but... It's one yeah. Right. No. Well, I guess you'll know but, when, you, when you go to pitch... A, a big streamer and they say, oh my God, you made Black Bear? You got it. That's right. that's, oh. that's right. <laughs> I went on Letterboxd and I, I looked at the number of uh, people that had written reviews. I was, I'm a big quote machine today, so I'll quote Andy Warhol. <laughs> and Andy Warhol said that you shouldn't um, read your reviews. You should just see how big they are and how many of them there are, how which is a, are kind here. of a great quote. Yeah, how many and how big. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does how big mean? Like, like how, how long? long? Oh, how long? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which can be good or bad for the filmmaker, as we know. Sometimes uh, okay. a first review is, is probably the, the most helpful. But I looked on Letterboxd, um, which I didn't really ever do before, but um, I saw 17,000 people watched it. I don't know if that's wow. a lot or a little, but I looked, I went to see Hong Sang Soo, his biggest movie. It was like the same. So I thought, okay, okay well, I made a weird movie like him. <laughs> and the same number of people watched it. And I guess that's cool. Right. Good enough for me. Well, I think it's like everything. It, if something's good, it'll find an audience. We're still talking about Cassavetes all these years later. Those were weird movies. People at the time didn't know what to make of them. And now we know how important they were. So that's but crazy I, to think about. <laughs> it is. Well, he but had they to got, like some of them got bad reviews. You're just like, hmm. I know. Well, things haven't changed that much in terms of the consumer facingness of the business. <laughs> It's always been there, but I want to congratulate both of you on this. It's a really special addition to quarantine viewing. And I think it's, it'll push a lot of people to think. And I, you know, that feels like an important mission right now. Can I plug a great movie I just saw? You can, please do. Uh, it's called Bloody Nose, Empty Bottle. Okay. Bloody have you guys seen this movie? No. You have to see it. It's so cool. And don't read anything about it till after okay. you watch it. But in it? terms of acting for a SAG audience, like, I don't know. It's, it's a documentary, but oh, okay. check, check, Wait, check it out. Bloody Nose, bloody nose what? Empty Pockets. Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets. <laughs> it's so good. I feel like it's like not, like not that many people know about it. So I just want to sh share that it's like one of the best movies ever. Wow. Okay. It's so good. Okay. Well, on that note, we all need another recommendation for viewing. So thank you for that. And congratulations to you both. Aubrey, stay safe and come back to the U.S. healthy and in one piece when, whenever that may be. <laughs> oh, also my wife's movie, Always Shine, is on Criterion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Always you, Shine. Check it out. It's great. You should have a, you should have a viewing recommendation show. <laughs> You're good at this. I know. I don't know. I, I want to like start a Twitter just to recommend movies, but I also don't want to be on Twitter. So. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, congratulations again on the movie. And I, I, I think it'll continue to take hold in a special way. And it's really great work. So congrats. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This was a great interview.